And again, it, let me explain uh, this, this, uh, this whole thing of torture-induced mind control. They, what they do is they shatter the mind. They, they kind of compare it to like a mirror. You break the mirror and there's a, like a thousand pieces there and each one has your reflection, but it looks a little bit different in each reflection. Each, each piece of glass is a little bit different, broken glass. And they say, you know, they torture you to the point where it fragments your mind and you have disassociative identity disorder. And then they program each of those personalities to do different things. And they have amnesia walls in between. And I mean, this is all scientific stuff that they've been perfecting. I mean, think about torture induced mind control. What uh, religious organization has perfected torture over hundreds of years? Oh, I don't know. Uh, gee, like Catholicism, perhaps? You know, people wonder why I'm so hard on Catholicism. Because it's Satan's church. That's why. It's just disgusting. But they torture people and they make trigger words that put them into other altars. And there's all, I mean, there's stuff all over YouTube about this. And, I, you know, be careful how much you research because it gets very, very, very vexing. But, I mean, there are Hollywood actors and actresses and musicians and, and football athletes and everything else. And they're all, you know, a lot of these people are MK Ultra mind controlled slaves. A lot of them are. But uh, page 96. Five distinct exercises each day. Uh, where do we read about the number five? I will be, I, 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 you know. I will be like the most high. Satan. Hmm. And that number five is all through the book too, by the way. Just showing you a couple here. There it talks about Christ our Lord. He will strive to imitate him. Again, you're imitating Jesus Christ. Here's the next quote here. Thought this was interesting. Page 107. Whoever, whoever wishes to imitate Christ our Lord, if he wishes to imitate our later, lady. So you can imitate either Jesus Christ or lady. Imitate Mary. Because they're both immaculately conceived. They both lived without sin. They both ascended up to heaven. Don't you know that? You know? So you can imitate either one. If you're crazy and filled with devils. Page 108. The third method of prayer is that at each breath or respiration he is to pray mentally as he says one word of the Our Father or any other prayer that is being recited so that between one breath and another a single word is said. Uh, again, I'm not going to show this on camera for sake of time, but you can look this up. It is in Rick Warren's 40 Days of, of uh, Purpose. I was going to say 40 Days of Prayer. 40 Days of Purpose. And in that book he talks about breath prayers. Right from the spiritual exercises. You know, and he recommends doing breath prayers. That's, you know, I didn't finish what I was saying there. You know, just recommending Jesuit practices, mind control practices. And again, you know, there, you know, another aspect of mind control, another facet of the whole thing is repetition, mindless repetition, getting into a trance like state, you know. He's very, very, very careful about this stuff, brethren. I mean, if you see this stuff, you're going to any place. You're part of anything. And you're seeing the, this, this model of somebody putting you down and somebody saying, you know, you're this and you're that. And they're trying to control you. And they're, they're trying to inflict pain upon you, trying to keep you in, in fear, trying to confuse you, whatever else. You are dealing with a system of mind control. And I realize there are different levels of this thing. There are people that are knowingly Jesuits that are doing this. There are other people that are just ignorantly repeating what they've gone through or whatever. I understand that. But Jesuit mind control, there's a lot more of it going on than you realize. We're going to hear about that later. Um, but let's continue here. Uh, this is uh, Rules for the Discernment of Spirits in the first week. Those who earnestly strive to purify themselves from their sins. Not Jesus Christ, you see. I mean, the most evil, most wicked people out there are not atheists and things like that. The most evil, wicked people are those that have convinced themselves that they can pay for their own sins without Jesus Christ and yet talk about Jesus Christ. Remember what Satan said back there in Isaiah chapter 14? I will be like the Most High. 
Satan wants to get just as close as he can to God without being God. And so it is with his ministers of righteousness. Satan's ministers, that's how they appear, as ministers of righteousness. They want to get just as close as they can to being Bible-believing Christians. And I believe right now, King James-only people that are actually Jesuit Satanists, been through some kind of a level of mind control, so they get, it does tie, back, tie them back to Jesuitry. But truly, ministers of Satan, I believe they're, they're coming out of the woodwork. I've talked about them. Martin Richling, I believe, is one. I believe Stephen Anderson is one. I believe a lot of these different people. There's a um, Church of the Wells down in Texas. These young guys are street preachers, and they're doing all this weird cultic stuff and everything, and they, they, got, uh, they talk about uh, the sin of presumption. You know, you'll pick up little, little aspects of Catholic doctrine in, mixed in with what looks like Bible-believing doctrine, Bible-believing practices. And this Church of the Wells, by the way, is a house church. Hmm. And they have all these weird cultic beliefs. I look down here, I thought this was interesting, kind of explaining the, the Jezebel spirit that you'll see with a lot of Roman Catholic women. For as is the nature of a woman in a quarrel with a man to lose courage and to take flight when the man makes a show of strength and determination, in like manner, if the man loses courage and begins to flee, in other words, she's controlling him, the anger, vindictiveness, and rage of the woman becomes great beyond all bounds. Very good description of the Jezebel spirit. Here we have page 133. And this is interesting. This is like they're describing themselves. You know, it's like the Jesuits are literally describing themselves with this. It says, It is characteristic of the evil one to transform himself into an angel of light, to work with the soul in the beginning, but in the end to work for himself. At first he will suggest good and holy thoughts that are in conformity with the disp disposition of a just soul. Then little by little he strives to gain his own ends by drawing the soul into his hidden deceits and perverse designs. <laughs> That's exactly what the Jesuits are. That's exactly what these guys will do. They will start out, they'll look like Bible believers, they'll sound like Christians. Billy Graham is one of the best examples of this. You listen to a lot of Billy Graham's old, old, old stuff. He's telling people to repent, you need to come to God as a sinner and everything else. And little by little, I don't think the Bible really teaches one way or another on purgatory. Um, I believe that all men are saved regardless if, regardless if they even know the name of Christ. Uh, the Pope is one of my dearest friends. See, they start them out as legitimate ministries and over time, they start to introduce a little bit more poison, a little bit more poison, a little bit more poison. It's almost like a Jesuit would do physically, if they could, get into the home of a Bible-believing Christian. They're not going to walk in and all of a sudden just yeah, and jump up with a, a knife. Uh-uh. Slowly, they'll earn your trust, and they'll slowly put a little bit of poison in your food, and a little bit more, a little bit more, until you're finally dead. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, like Jesus Christ warned about. You know, I think about William Tyndale. William Tyndale, I forget the guy's name, but this guy came along and he was basically an informer for the government, for the Catholics. And William Tyndale, way back in the early 1500s, before Ignatius Loyola, uh, Ignatius de Loyola, um, way back before him, William Tyndale was trying to translate the Bible into English. And uh, I think it's like 95% of his work is basically carried over into the King James Bible. He was uh, really did a good job of translating. But um, he was having to run because the Catholics were after him. The Catholics were in control of the government at the time and uh, openly in control, not secretly like they are now. But uh, he was running from these Catholics and things, and they actually hired a man to go in as an inside informer and basically to befriend William Tyndale, and he did, and he, was, he took William Tyndale in, out in this back alley and right into the hands of soldiers, into a trap. And William Tyndale was taken to prison, and, and I think it was like a year, just right around a year or so, plus or minus, uh, that he was in this prison and down in the dungeon in the basement, and then he was taken out and strangled and burned at the stake. Uh, so, Interesting. Because, I mean, the, the Catholics have been doing this. In other words, it wasn't just Loyola that founded the whole thing. They've been doing it, you know, for a long, long time. But Loyola, uh, Ignatius, uh, actually perfected it. 
But let's continue here. Page 136, just about done with this book here. Decrees and orders that the furnish, furniture of a bishop be plain and poor. The same consideration applies to all states of life. And again, we're going to see that coming up in my studies on the Amish, which we're going to be coming out with here in the next couple of weeks, that this, oh, we're plain people. We're the plain, the plain simple folk. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. And they are just, I grew up hearing rumors and stories, and a lot of it I didn't believe because it was just so, so wild sinful, horrible stuff that you can't even imagine. And I just kind of dismissed a lot of it. But through my research here recently and reading firsthand accounts of Amish that have come out of it and things, the Amish system is one of the mo most satanic. Amish are doing things that Roman Catholics wouldn't do. Roman Catholics would have the moral convictions to say, are you crazy? I'm not doing that. The Amish system is one of the most satanic of all cults and i've been dealing with them here locally too by the way last couple of months and i'm seeing things and hearing things and they're giving me materials and we're buying books and things from them and 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 we've been researching it my wife and i we're just like every day we get up research 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 i mean it's just you know i dream it i mean we just you know it's in my dream it's in my thoughts it's just all the time it's just crazy the things that the Lord has been showing us. And it all goes back to here. It all goes back to this system of mind control. You're going to believe some of the stuff that we're going to be bringing out. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, if, if we're uh, suicided or something like that, uh, know that uh, that was never um, something that we were for. Okay, We're going to be bringing out a lot of studies. So if something happens and we don't bring out the studies and something, you know, you hear about us or whatever, we didn't commit suicide, okay? I just want to say that for the record, okay? I trust in the Lord, but I know that sometimes the Lord allows His saints to be, you know, martyred. And so I'm just going to throw it out there right now for what it's worth. And you say, well, uh, Brian, you're kind of getting into some dangerous territory here. Good. Okay? I trust the Lord. Uh, just kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They say, bow down to the image. No. Well, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Go ahead. And I don't say that out of arrogance or, or pride or whatever else. I say because I trust God. I fear God more than men. Um, but continuing here, rules for thinking with the church. Okay? You got a good uh, local church that you're going to? Here's the rules for thinking with it. In order to have the proper attitude of mind in the church, militant, we should observe the following rules. Putting aside all private judgment, we should keep our minds prepared and ready to obey promptly in all things the true spouse of Christ our Lord, our Holy Mother, the hierarchical church. Now, how much is that philosophy? I had a, I had a brother write on, in one of the comments, really appreciated the comment, you know, and he said, he said that uh, about how that, um, the Baptist, there was a Baptist minister back in the like 1850s, and he was writing about how that many Baptists were starting to adopt Catholic practices and philosophies back in the mid-1800s. How much more so today? But you see the philosophy there. I mean, look at that. Putting aside all private judgment, we should keep our minds prepared and ready to obey promptly and in all things the true spouse of, our, of Christ our Lord, our Holy Mother, the hierarchical church. How many times have I heard that? Don't question the man of God. Excuse me. Don't question the man of God. You know, your life is to be in service to the church. You know, I remember I was going to a Mount Zion Baptist church the one time. Keith Schweitzer was the pastor. And he said, a bunch of families left because they said, we're not being fed. And he said, you don't come to church to be fed. You come to church to do things for the church. Okay. So when the Bible says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre but of a ready mind, I guess that was just idle talk or something. Page 140. To praise the adornments and buildings of churches as well as sacred images and to venerate them according to what they represent. Hey, stop running in the house of God. Isn't it good to be in the house of God? Oh, isn't it wonderful that we built this such a wonderful church to the glory of God? And then you study the fact that a lot of the big Babel buildings have been built by Masons. 
like I talked about in my uh, Great Falling Away study, and Masonic uh, adornments like obelisks on top that they call steeples. And, you know, we've all been mind-controlled through this stuff, brethren. You know, I'm not pointing the finger and putting anybody down here. I'm saying I went through this stuff myself. Let's continue. Number nine. Finally, to praise all the precepts of the church, holding ourselves ready at all times to find reasons for their defense and never offending against them. All the rules, in other words, of the church. You should never offend against them. How many of you have heard that one? Down here, as a result, the people would be angry with their superiors, whether temporal or spiritual. Again, that's a key thing to understand about Catholicism. They believe that they have two swords, the temporal and the spiritual. In other words, a church state, a government and church all together as one. And that's what the coming New World Order, the one world government that is rapidly approaching, that's what they're going to have. So, in Matters of execution, it's the church that decides. Burn the heretic, in other words. Cut the head of the heretic off. You see? Number 11, to praise both positive and scholastic theology. Is that going on today? Again, remember, 500-year-old book here. And you're to praise both positive and scholastic theology. Oh, you have a PhD, you have a THD, you have a THM, you have an honorary doctorate, or whatever. We're so honored to have Dr. So-and-so here tonight. Let's continue. To define and explain for our times the things necessary for eternal salvation. There's only one thing necessary for eternal salvation, and that is you putting your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Understand that you're a sinner. Understand why you are coming for salvation. Okay? Then you put your faith in Jesus Christ. One thing. All right, sorry about that. Had a little bit of an interruption, but we're back now. I'm going to show you the next one here, number 13. If we wish to be sure that we are right in all things, we should always be ready to accept this principle. I will believe that the white that I see is black if the hierarchical church so defines it. For I believe that between the bridegroom, Christ our Lord, and the bride, his church, there is but one spirit which governs and directs us for the salvation of our souls for the same spirit and Lord who gave us the Ten Commandments, guides and governs our Holy Mother Church. Now, if you've seen the uh, study I did on Jack Hiles, the third part there, where uh, Russell Anderson, I think it's the third part, Russell Anderson is like there at his birthday party, uh, Jack Hiles' birthday party, and he says, you know, when I was in school, I learned that the alphabet, you know, it's, it's A comes before H, so it should be Anderson Hiles College, you know, ha, 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 they're joking. And one of the students stands up and he says, if Brother Hiles told us that H comes before A, we would believe it. Right there it is. And how many cults out there, whatever denomination, whatever name, it's that exact thing. This is not the authority. It's the hierarchical church, the hierarchy, the leadership. You know what you're dealing with? You are dealing with Jesuit mind control. That's what you're dealing with. When you have these guys, these men of God that you don't dare question, that turn you away from Scripture and turn you to themselves as the final authority. That's exactly what they are. They're using mind control tactics. But let's continue here, page 141. I thought this was interesting. No one can be saved unless it is, it be predestinated or predestined. And uh, my wife was looking at this the one time she wrote Calvinism. You know, sounds kind of like Calvinism. As a result, they become apathetic and neglect the works that are conducive to their salvation. You know, talking about all this stuff in here, but interesting here, works salvation again. But interesting that they would say about being predestined for salvation. Makes you kind of wonder about John Calvin, doesn't it? Number 16, in like manner, and of course I understand 
you know, John Calvin, let me just say this, John Calvin was before, you know, Ignatius de Loyola, so don't write that in the comments. And John Calvin came before, blah, 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 yeah. So did Martin Luther. They were both basically papist in their philosophy. But uh, number 16, in like manner, we must be careful, lest by speaking too much and with too great emphasis on faith, we give occasion to the people to become indolent and lazy in the performance of good works. Hmm. Interesting because you had uh, Andersnake, Stephen Andersnake, and he came out and he was like, you know, you need to get your lazy butt in church. You know, that's what the house church movement's all about, that people are too lazy to come to church. Interesting. Hmm. No connection, I'm sure. You know. So that's going to be it for that book there, the Spiritual Exercises book. Uh, just, just insane this whole system of mind control. But um, I'm going to take a break here, and when we come back, I'm going to have a special guest here, and uh, we're going to hear about firsthand experience of actually being right on the brink of going into the Jesuit mind control system. So we will have that when we return. All right. Well, we are joined here by my wife, uh, Sister Catherine. Many of you know her. As Sister Catherine, and uh, if you haven't seen her testimony, you know it's been a long time since she's been on camera. She's not uh, the camera type like I am. She's our, our my silent uh, research partner. But um, my wife, if you haven't heard her testimony, was actually in a lot of the um, military industrial complex type of, of situations, and and uh, she was in a lot of this. Um, uh, well, I'll let you, I'll let her tell it. But um, who was the? There was a professor that you knew that was a Jesuit. Why don't you tell everybody about that? Well, I was a student at at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, during 2007 to 2008. Left in spring, early summer of 2008, and sometime in the last half of 2007, if I'm not mistaken, I took a course by the name of. Western Civilization at GMU in Fairfax. It was an accelerated course for that particular term and my professor was Mark A. Stoneman who has a PhD from Georgetown University and if you're familiar with the video that we did several months ago about the Jesuitical connection to education or university col college scam so to speak you'll realize that Georgetown is on the list of Jesuitical institutions. So, mm -hmm. he's very highly trained, considering he's a PhD. Yeah. And uh, so, that was, my, that was my first experience dealing with a full-fledged Jesuit. Yeah. And I didn't even know it at the time. I had no clue when I took that course that Georgetown was a Jesuit institution right across the river from where my campus was. And as a matter of fact, GMU has probably even still to this day, if I'm not mistaken, an articulation agreement with Georgetown University, meaning if you're enrolled as a student at either school, you can um, take courses at each institution. Like Georgetown people can go to GMU and take classes and through a special registration process and GMU can do the same at Georgetown through a special articulation agreement. Mm -hmm. And you know I need to point this out too. This is all while she was lost that she she really didn't you know you didn't understand anything about the Jesuits or whatever. Right. And you were even thinking about maybe taking courses there or something wasn't that the thing you like actually went you were like thinking about maybe possibly Georgetown or something for a little bit? I was. I had actually looked at them as a potential um, university to attend at one point. And uh, ironically, the admissions counselor, whatever his position was at the time that I spoke to, it was evidently Ash Wednesday of all days that I went there for this, you know, on-campus interview, unbeknownst to me. <laughs> and you know, just what the Ash Wednesday ordeal means to Roman Catholics and the Vatican. And honestly, I could not stop staring at his ash mark on his forehead. Mark and that was about, yes, that was pretty much the focus of my intent, of my intention the entire time while trying to listen to what he was telling me. 
and I could not stop staring at that thing. I thought he had used his pencil and fallen asleep throughout the day and put some kind of a weird pencil mark on his forehead. If you haven't if you haven't seen that, uh, get around an area where there's Catholics, a lot of them. I remember we were up in, uh, when we were down in Eldred, Pennsylvania, uh, we were in, it was right near the New York border, and so we were over in uh, New York the one time at, at a grocery store, and we saw these people coming in, they got this black mark upon their forehead, and it's like, what in the world? So, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, get around some Catholics, you'll see it. <laughs> but, uh, secondly, then a couple years later, uh, you were going to another university, so you went to six different universities over the years, um, so going to another university, and tell what happened there with the a retreat. Well, um, there is in between, I don't know the timing of all this, but I will say this before I get to my most recent university, before I completely washed my hands of the university scam forever. I was thinking about applying to a place called Loyola of, of Maryland, or Loyola College of Maryland at one point years ago. It was a college university career fair, so to speak, on campus. Um, was it Germantown or one of those places in, in Maryland, the D.C. region, and I had talked to an admissions counselor from Loyola College of Maryland, again, completely ignorant of Loyola and the whole Jesuitical institution, and again, the Lord kept me from applying there because if I had applied and gotten accepted, only the Lord knows what would have happened. I probably would not be telling you about this to this day. But um, that was another... That and the Lord protecting me from my Jesuitical professor in Virginia, another, uh, another situation that God's grace and mercy kept me from falling into serious, serious trouble from. Um, but most recently, when I was out in Boston, Massachusetts in 2011, I came out there to, to utilize my GI Bill benefits, again, ignorant of what the GI Bill system is, it's just welfare. If you're watching this and you're thinking about using your GI Bill benefits because you're a veteran of the military of any branch, don't use it. It's welfare in disguise. But anyhow, when I was out there, I was invited to a Catholic, also known as a Jesuitical retreat center, retreat weekend during the months of January to early July, late June, early July of 2011. It was sometime in that in that five to six month window when I was a university student at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. At the time I was taking both on campus and, and online classes because with the GI Bill, the yellow ribbon GI Bill, they say that they'll give you tuition benefits, you know, according to, the, to that particular part of the GI Bill program, if you take at least one on-campus class. You can take all online classes at the time that I enrolled in it, but you have to take one campus-based class in order for you to actually receive your benefits, i.e. welfare. So I learned that the hard way about the whole ordeal of, th of that. Again, don't even go near the GI Bill program. Don't sign up for it. Um, and in fact, in fact, don't join the military. Yes. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Filled with sodomites and Satanists and Jesuits. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but anyhow, at as a as a university student there at Northeastern, um, I ran into a man by the a Catholic nonetheless by the name of. Mr. John Spadaccini, and uh, I had no idea this is how ignorant and stupid I was, and by God's grace and mercy, I did not fall into the Vatican's trap because Boston is is the headquarters of uh, it's it's excuse me quick the Archdiocese of Boston is located in Braintree, Massachusetts, and so um, unbeknownst to me, my studio apartment at the time after I moved out of the city, when I first got to Massachusetts for my classes, was not far from the Archdiocese of Boston. And the Vatican is very, very crafty in how it, how it places its strategic Archdiocese buildings across the country. 
this one in particular looks like a general office building, you know, three-story office building with the red brick and the black windows that you can't see from the outside. You can't see inside from outside the parking lot. And when I first walked up to the building um, at one at one point out there in Massachusetts, it looked like just a regular executive office building. And I don't know if I saw the sign outside of the, the building or not that said Archdiocese or even if it has one. But I just know that uh, when I stepped foot into that building for the first time, because... Again, I was ignorant of what Mr. Spadaccini actually worked in. He was some kind of a business accounts manager for the Archdiocese of Boston. Under the guise of some charity organization, he was trying to, to sign up local businesses in the Boston region, you know, get him to sign up with, his, with the Vatican, essentially, you know, and do some kind of business transaction on, like, a monthly basis, like monthly donations or something. And, um... And so, Mr. Spadaccini invited me to this weekend retreat, so to speak. And I, and I said to him at the time, I said, uh, number one, I can't afford it, you know. And that was true. Because of being under the GI Bill welfare program, I couldn't afford it. And number two, I had academic obligations. And ever since I can remember growing up, I've been told, you know, I was told by my parents growing up, you're not allowed to do such and such till your homework is done. And so I stayed by that motto. Even out there, I, I told myself, you know, I'm not going to do anything until I can afford it. And if my homework is done, then I'll look into it. And so I told him those two reasons. He tried to talk me into obtaining uh, a financial scholarship on behalf of his archdiocese work uh, employer and he said well we can give you a financial scholarship to go and I said no I'm not going you know again I have homework to do and it's not done and if I get it done then I'll think about it but the Lord you know worked it out so that way I was kept busy enough with my homework at that time that I didn't have time to even think about going to this satanic Jesuitic Jesuitical retreat center nonsense. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, he never asked me again to go to a retreat. Yeah. But um, when, I, when I appeared in person at the Archdiocese of Boston building in Braintree, Massachusetts, the second I stepped through the door and the doors shut behind me, I was greeted by a nun or what's called a sister in a blue habit full habit, you know, the tire, um, I don't know all the names of the articles of the habit, but you could only see her face, full headgear thing going on, and the full, you know, modest blue habit gown or whatever, and she was like, oh, great to see you, gave me a hug, and I just felt really, really uncomfortable there, and I also saw the, um, what is it, the chapel, the uh, adoration chapel thing that they have there and I saw it from the closed door just peering into it and I was creeped out by what I saw and I also just happened to see a little bit of the gift shop there in the building and I saw a whole bunch of ro of rosaries and uh, ironically similar to the one that I was given by the secretary of my employer from 2006, 2005, 2006, when I worked for Vance Uniform Protection Services, because she said, you know, oh, here, she, she thought she was doing a good, a good thing for me by giving me this rosary, and I thought, what is this thing? And I started noticing over time after I, you know, received it from her that weird things started happening you know, from having that rosary, and I just felt really uncomfortable, and then one day, I just suddenly, somehow, made the, ros the rosary just disappear, I lost it somehow, and uh, I haven't seen it ever since, and I thank the Lord that I just seemed to lose my rosary. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, isn't it? Yeah. It's just terrible. Now she's going to have to spend more time in purgatory. Yep. Right. And uh, so... so 
the Lord indubitably kept me kept me safe from all the Jesuits that were in that center. And there were I saw not only Mr. Spadaccini's workplace, if you went through the doorway and you took a left, and then through this one channel or corridor in the building and up a flight of stairs was where he worked. Because mm -hmm. I was ignorant of what the whole thing meant. I had no idea it was the Archdiocese of Boston. I thought it was a charity organization he worked for. But again, charity organizations all tie back to the Vatican. Yep. But, uh, you know, and, and just make a comment here about everything that you've been saying. And that is that, you know, it's not that she was seeking, you know, actually actively wanting to become a Jesuit and actively wanting to be mind controlled. It's just being raised Lutheran, which is essentially Roman, Roman Catholicism. Catholic. Yeah. It just going through that, you're on a list and it's like, oh, there's better promise for something like that. You know, I mean, I just was like when I got out of high school, I was like, no universities, no military. I'm just going to work. I, mean, I was working all through high school, you know, high school just kept me from, you know, all high school was for me was a time to mess around and fool around and, you know, act stupid and things, you know, with my friends. And it was just keeping me from being full time in, in employment. So I really didn't get to experience a lot of this thing of being right there, you know, almost falling into this exact system here. I mean, I went through different levels of mind control. Don't get me wrong. Public schooling and television and that's that's all mind control stuff, but to actually be right there, almost falling into this, my wife can definitely tell you about that. But another interesting story here. I I don't have the overhead camera on for this our little interview here, but um, this thing I had showed earlier, Sidney Gottlieb, the head of MK Ultra for the CIA, his uh, obituary says here. This is the L.A. Times, by the way. Um, it says here. Gottlieb and his associates in MKUltra also took LSD trips, although the concept of tripping would not enter the American lexicon for another decade. They laced coffee with LSD and served it to each other without warning. And this is something else that they would do, that the CIA was known for. It's in the congressional hearings that they, they would actually, or Senate hearings, I guess, they would actually go into bars, they would go into different places like that, and they would actually spike people's drinks. You know, you, you get up, you go to the bathroom, they'd, they'd slip something into your drink, and, and you'd come back and you'd take a drink, and oh boy. And a certain somebody I won't mention here has another story about while she was uh, in the military, and was it, was it right around the time of the spook training? Maybe. Your, yeah. Certain somebody, I, I don't know. Yeah, so, so uh, maybe you could tell us who that certain somebody was. So. Well... Let me clue you in on a few little details. It was 2004. It was sometime between August and December of 2004. I was in Signals Intelligence Training. Signals Intelligence Analyst Training, to be exact. Also known as 98 Charlie in Army Military Occupational Specialties, or MOSs. At the time that I went to the school. It could be changed by now, for all I know. I, I'm not sure if they've reclassified it as something else, but the point is, is I was a 98 Charlie in training, and I was, I went with a friend by the name of James Vincent Henry, who was either assigned to a KPOC, Civil Affairs Psychological Operations Command affiliated unit himself, or was buddy-buddy with this KPOC officer in charge of a of a unit in in the DC area where he's originally from and um, I didn't know what Graham Central Station was when I was down there and he you know talked me into going on at least one occasion and I went and exactly what Brian has described about you you leave you're at a bar you leave you know to go to the bathroom you come back after getting a drink and you take a drink you take a sip of your drink and almost immediately you start feeling woozy, like, uh, and that's exactly what happened to me. Instead of falling on the floor unconscious, you know, after drinking at least one sip of my orange juice, because I had ordered orange juice that night, you know, thinking it was a safe thing to drink, you know, and, uh, 
I come back from the bathroom because I didn't take my drink with me. They were making it while I went to the to the bathroom. And came back, took a sip or two of my of my orange juice, and I immediately started feeling very, very drowsy and off balance. And instead of passing out on the floor, I ended up uh, unfortunately uh doing a little bit of table dancing as a result of being intoxicated because of my spiked drink. And um and was it was it James that put it in there? You know? I don't know. Was it somebody else? Was it another spook from the CIA or a Jesuit in the area? I don't know. I still don't know to this day who spiked my drink, but I know that James was the one who told me, you know, I think somebody spiked your drink. You know, you might want to talk to your unit about this as soon as you can. And I tried to do that, and they, and they asked me, well, who did it? I said, I don't know. But I just know my drink was spiked, you know, when I was at Graham Central Station on such and such day. And they, and they didn't believe me. And then it led to problems down the road where I was starting to question a lot of people's behavior, and I got thrown into a command-directed psychological evaluation for anger management along with uh, another situation off base and um, and basically my unit threw me into this counseling session over anger management issues and I simply told the shrink because that's what a psychologist or psychiatrist likes to do they like to shrink your brain through drugs that's the whole point of going to, to a shrink for counseling and medication therapy. They like to literally try and shrink your brain to having no conscience left. And, you know, the Lord helped me get out of that by simply rationally explaining what had happened. And Mm -hmm. I believe that the Lord put this specific person, you know, in the place of the shrink position to say, yeah, you know, any rational person would have reacted the same way that you did there's nothing wrong. You did nothing wrong here. You're just, you know, it, this is a logical outcome of what you went through. So he cleared Mm -hmm. me to go for full duty again, no restrictions and whatnot. But still to this day, I have no idea who spiked my drink, you know? Yep. And that's why it's dangerous to get into that crowd. That's why, you know, I, I mean, I understand, uh, I'm not against military type of things. I'm not against soldiers. But our modern military is not the military that we had even 20, 30 years ago. Uh, things have gotten really bad. And I've known a lot of guys from the military. Um, and, you know, I, uh, former um, our deacon, assistant, pastor, whatever you want to call him, uh, Brother Jesse Dulesky from Bible Believers Fellowship down there in Lancaster County. He was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. And he said, absolutely not military, you know, bad news. So if you're in the military and you're watching this and you're thinking, you know, well, they they hate the military. No, don't hate the military. It's just the modern military is very wicked. So, but uh, again, uh, just, you know, the being so close to this whole system of mind control. And, you know, it just, it's amazing the things that can happen. But we're going to finish up here with our study in Philippians chapter 3. I want to talk for a minute about what is real salvation? Okay, because we've seen in the spiritual exercises book that they present a very warped view of salvation, a, a salvation that basically you're saving yourself. You come to a point where you kill your conscience and you say, I'm not a sinner, I'm not a bad person, I don't deserve, you know, well, you, you would say that you're a sinner and that you're a bad person, but you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ. You say, I'm going to follow Christ, I'm going to imitate Christ. I'm going to do what he did so I can save myself. I'm going to show you why that doesn't work. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. We'll read here. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and and, and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. When you really come to God as a sinner and you're broken, you realize that you are absolutely no good. So for somebody to come to you at that point in time and say, hey, you know what? You can save yourself. You know, 
a repentant sinner is going to be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I tried everything in life to try and, and save myself and try to be a good person. It doesn't work. I'm rotten. I'm miserable. I'm no good. The only chance I have at getting saved is my faith in Jesus Christ. And that's it. And his precious blood to wash away my sins. I'm not going to save myself. I can, you know, I can, I'll pinch myself. And if I do it enough, I'm going to save myself. Oh, give me a break. You know, I'm going to whip myself or put nails around my, you know, hair, shirt, and all this other Catholic pagan nonsense. Absolutely ridiculous. You're not going to save yourself. It's not going to happen. Let's continue. Verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But now look what he says. See, he was a Jew. I mean, he was a really devout Jew. You know, a Pharisee, as a matter of fact. Verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And what do he think about those things that he lost? And do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him. You ready? Not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of christ the righteousness which is of god by faith this nonsense over here this i mean like i said earlier this thing is actually older than your king james bible that's how long this thing's been around and so many of the systems that we have today be it through television, Hollywood, you know, uh, the university scam, the military, uh, most organized religions, you know, this is the underlying philosophy. You can be a self-righteous person and live a life where you're crucifying yourself and you're doing all kinds of things. You're coming to church every time the doors are open. You're volunteering, you're mowing the yard, you're doing this, you're doing cleaning the toilets, you're doing all this stuff. Why? And you say, well, well, yes, but they have faith, you know, and things like this. You know, and again, I've seen that. I've seen some of these people that are like ultra involved in their Babel buildings. And you talk to them, you know, I mean, I, I remember, just tell you a real quick story here. The one time we were out door to door and, you know, this, we met this older guy and we said, uh, you know, if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you would go? And he said, yes, I do. I'd go to heaven. We said, how do you know? And he said, well, I'll, I'll tell you. He said, years ago I would have said it was because I was a good person and active in my church and, and everything like that. But he said, you know, I've come to realize since then that I was never really saved up until recently here when I realized what a rotten sinner I am. And I put my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, that's all that's going to get me into heaven. Not my own works, not my own goodness. That's the right answer saved not coming and saying i understand i'm a sinner i understand jesus died for me i understand the terrors of hell i understand all this other stuff but i think i can make it by my own self-righteousness no I, you can't no you can't i learned that the hard way because i tried very very hard to do what i was told you know honor my parents my roman catholic parents otherwise called lutherans and they all their lives they've they've they tried to drill it into my head, you know, this thing of go to church, go to church. And I tried to be a good person through community service projects. Never made me happy. You know, when when those events in Boston happened, you know, the potential falling into Jesuitical mind control, you know, I was also told, you know, when I was deployed in 2010, that if I didn't pipe down, so to speak, and stop speaking my mind, I would be sent to a command-appointed psychological evaluation in Germany. And I believe that the Lord kept me from, from going into that, because if I would have gone to Germany for a psychological evaluation at that point, I probably would have been undergoing MKUltra programming, without a doubt. 
if I had allowed myself to do that, and the Lord would have allowed me to do that. And it's only by God's grace and mercy that I'm here today telling you that, yes, MKUltra is real. Brainwashing, mind control programming from the Jesuits, from the Vatican, CIA, military security and industrial complex, it's real. Mm. Hello. By God's grace and mercy, I would not be here today telling you this if the Lord did not take me out of that. In fact, I'd probably be working for the Jesuits if the Lord hadn't saved me out of that whole Mm -hmm. ordeal before saving me in October of 2011. Yeah. And, you know, that's how close you can get to it. You know, it is it is very, very pervasive in our society. And like I said, it isn't just, you know, you being taken someplace, some military place or whatever, some psychological mental institution or whatever else to be programmed. Um, there are even different levels of programming within our culture. And, I mean, you just, that's why I read that book. And it's like, I mean, you talk to the average person on the street when you're witnessing you will get this thing over and over again. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. How are they coming up with that? Because this ideology here has been implanted into so many different tentacles of our society where people say, you can save yourself. You know, and it's it's just incredible. But really wanted to do that study to kind of set up our, our future series that's going to be coming out here. I'm going to be doing an introduction video, so I'm not going to give a whole lot away. But um, the, the Mennonite, Amish, Hutterite, Bruderhof, uh, all this stuff, these communities, um, it, it's just, the corruption is incredible. It's some really, really bad stuff. And it all goes back to this exact philosophy right here. And uh, it's insane. The, the stuff that we're going to be bringing out, um, it's going to be good, some good stuff. So... Uh, We're going to close now. We'll close here with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, that um, you have given us your word and that this this book, this amazing book, can actually lead us into the truth and keep us out of the mind control system of Satan. And uh, Lord, you're the ones that you're the only one that should be controlling our mind. And uh, your word says that we are to bring every thought into captivity, captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I pray, Lord, for everyone out there that uh, that everybody would just really, well, those that are saved, that they would truly uh, get control of their minds, Lord, and, and not uh, fall for all this brainwashing stuff through uh, television and, and just popular media and, and the university scam and military and, and even the Babel buildings, Lord, are just, they're just totally controlled. And it's just getting worse and worse. And um, I pray, Lord, for those that are out there that are, they're still going to the Babel buildings, Lord, that they would just, uh, that you would show them the truth. Because uh, I know that everybody's seen things that, that go to Babel buildings. We've all seen things that have disturbed us and, and just don't line up with your word. And I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would convict out there of, of that. And uh, Lord, I just really am praying um, that you would just keep all of us in your word uh, until you take us out of here soon. And I do pray that that day would be uh, rapidly approaching and uh, Lord if there's still somebody that's lost that's watched this whole thing um, some Jesuits or something that are still watching uh, Lord I pray that you would help them to realize that that they are not elite uh, they are not some special chosen group that's somehow going to escape your wrath um, help them to realize that they can't save themselves and that torment that they feel where they're always trying to achieve and always trying to get ahead and uh, always worried about what other people are thinking about them and maybe might do to them. Uh, That fear that they're living in, Lord, they are themselves under mind control and and, and, uh, they think that they might be controlling other people and and, uh, working to bring in quite a powerful new world order. But I hope, I pray, Lord, that you would help them to realize that they're just slaves and that they're going to go to hell with their master Satan, except they repent and get out of it. So I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So that's going to be it for this study. It was a rather long study, but uh, this, I'll tell you what, it's just like studying this stuff. um, Like I said, we we have been dealing with um, some Amish 
in the area. Uh, I actually was, uh, for a couple months, I was going and visiting with them uh, once a week in their home and talking about the Bible and everything else. And, and, you know, growing up around the Amish, growing up with Mennonite grandparents, a lot of relatives that were Mennonite, uh, seeing that whole thing. And, and I saw a lot that you just kind of put into the back of your mind and just say, you know, I, I don't really understand what that was. I don't, I don't know what that was. And a lot of that stuff has been coming out as we've been studying. And I mean, reading their writings, the stuff that they, they believe there and studying, just really putting a lot of time into study this whole thing. I mean, it's just been, I don't even know, a couple months now that we've been studying now and uh, just really making sure that our, that we have a good case and we do. So Lord's really shown us some neat stuff. We will be coming out with that. Uh, Lord willing, within the next couple of weeks, it will be multi-part. Um, you know, I, I, it's always been a challenge for me to be like, okay, you know, do I try to make this my preaching and teaching uh, just quick so you can watch it? And it's you know half hour, forty-five minute sermons, or do I just really bring it out? And my practice has usually been to really bring it out, uh, just simply because. God's called me to be a Bible uh, preacher and teacher. I want to teach subjects. I want to have lots of documentation, lots of things that I can show. And uh, so that's what we're going to be doing. It's it's not going to be little entertainment or something like that. It's going to be some very heavy teaching and a lot of doctrine and things like that. Um, I mean, this, this study here, there were, weren't many scriptures we went to. Simply because if you're saved, you understand self-righteousness is not going to get you to heaven. But I needed to show this thing as the foundation for the studies that are coming in the future. To understand where this teaching of this self-righteousness, this we can imitate Christ, let's bring in the kingdom. Where does it come from? It comes purely from the Roman Catholics and specifically from the Jesuits. So, with that said, we do thank you for your prayers. And uh, thank you for the donations uh, to all that keep us uh, in ministry, uh, it's a great responsibility, and we and we really do appreciate that. Like I said, uh, my wife does not appear on camera very often um, because she's usually very very busy putting a lot of the information together. Uh, I mean, she just you know she does a lot of research, and um, and I'm very thankful that the Jesuits didn't get a hold of her and and use her for that side. Me too. I thank and the so. Lord very very much for saving me out of out of their their grasp so many times the the GMU professor the archdiocese of boston ordeal the you know potential applying uh, to georgetown and loyal college of maryland you know i looked at both of those schools and now that i understand the whole agenda of university and all its tentacles the whole concept of of university is not intellectual achievement it's just simply a, a type of brainwashing you know this philosophical brainwashing of self-righteousness and to explain god away and to basically tell you that in in its purest form of atheism but atheism is catholicism that's the whole agenda behind university schooling is to take god out of the picture mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I don't think we have anything else to say. Well, I, I do want to point out the thing about the communi the communitarianism. the Another study. That's another a whole other subject. That could be another hour. So. But you mentioned it as, as far as it ties in with the spiritual exercises. And I just want to say this. If you've heard of Sovereign Man Confidential, which I have experience in, um... If you've heard of that and you're thinking of globalizing your life to get away from the New World Order, don't do it. You will not escape the New World Order. There's no reason to be afraid of it if you are truly saved and you've come to God as a repentant, contrite, broken sinner. And just stay put because it's everywhere. You cannot escape it. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is trust in the Lord to protect you from whatever the system is going to try and do to you right and on that note you know the whole survivalism thing 
you know, I, I think a lot of us have gone through some of that, the desire to start stockpiling things to survive hard times and whatever else. Uh, I think the better thing to do is just really get on fire for the Lord and really serve the Lord and let him take care of you. Amen. And that's not some kind of, oh, well, you're afraid to face. Uh, how is it that you can, you know, people come up with this philosophy that, you know, I say, I'm just going to trust the Lord to take care of us. Oh, well, then you're afraid to face the enemy. Uh, no, because we're actually going out after the spiritual enemies by coming out and attacking the Jesuits and exposing, you know, attacking them spiritually, I'm saying, you know, and, and you know, exposing the works of darkness. Uh, that's, that's where you're going to get your protection, uh, by being on the firing line for the Lord. I mean, give him a reason to protect you. Amen. You know, don't go and hide someplace because you believe you're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble or some other thing like that. And this is some of the stuff that, you know, uh, my wife was into early on in her salvation because, again, she was ignorant. I know a lot of people out there are ignorant. You might have watched this study just to hear about the this mind control stuff and MK Ultra and whatever. And you're, you know, it's it's scary stuff, you know, but don't hide from the devil. Okay, you have a spiritual weapon here that is far more powerful than anything that they have in their arsenal. This King James Bible, most powerful physical thing in the world. All right, there's nothing more powerful than this book. And that's why I say read it, believe it, preach it. So, we better quit before this video gets much longer. So, that'll be it. Again, thank you to everybody who uh, prays for the ministry and uh, all those who donate, keep us going. And um, I think that's it. I think so. You don't know so. No, I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't really know for sure. So, all right. We'll see you in the next video.